This is a supplemental video on analysis strategy. One of its purposes is to assist you in developing an analysis strategy to use when analyzing the palliative care data set for your final exam. As a disclaimer, developing an analysis strategy involves not only the science of statistics, but the art of statistics as well. Different statisticians will practice this art differently, although with su substantial similarities. What you'll hear isn't necessarily the gospel truth, but something that works for me. The context within which I usually operate is outcomes research, practice improvement research, and quality of life research. I usually don't work on studies such as early phase cancer trials, where there's an ethical imperative to use the data in the most absolutely and most efficient way possible. Most of the work that I do, the primary criteria for a successful analysis plan, in that it's statistically optimal, in other words, that it squeezes the last available knowledge from the data, but rather it's both sufficiently powerful and clear. In other words, I'm using the data to tell a story. And what I want is for the story to be both right and also for my re easy for my audience to understand. I'm trying to extract the 80% of knowledge from the data that's easy to get at and probably true and aren't worried about that last 20%. One piece of information that's helpful but not decisive is a mapping of scale of measurement versus statistical technique. For example, our class is first organized around the scale of measurement of the outcome variable. Continuous outcomes map to, its, to linear relation, regression and its various cousins. Dichotomous outcomes map to logistic regression. And time to event outcomes map to survival analysis. Considering continuous outcomes, we then mapped a single continuous predictor to simple linear regression mapped a single categorical predictor to one-way ANOVA, and so forth. Scale of measurement narrows the analyst choices, but doesn't eliminate them. For example, suppose that the outcome variable is continuously scaled. I could choose to dichotomize this outcome, resulting in a logistic regression, or keep it continuously scaled, resulting in a multivariable linear regression. How then does one make this sort of choice? The principle I use is to first limit the choices to those that are statistically reasonable given the scale of measurement within the analysis, and then try to select the choice that best matches the, both the study question and the data. Occam's razor applies. Simpler is better, the two reasons being that, sim that something that's simple is on average more likely to be true, and also that simpler will be easier for the audience to understand, and, and that matters. As I build an analysis plan, some additional principles are to work from the simple to the complex, to always try to help the reader to visualize the data, to keep the reader oriented at all times. Some dimensions of this orientation are making explicit links between study questions and statistical analysis, as in this analysis is intended to answer this specific question, and between analysis and results, as in the results of this analysis help us to answer this question by providing this information. I'll now walk you through a simplified example, albeit one that's based on an actual study. At the big picture level, a colleague is studying the impact of cost of cancer care, especially on how patients cope with those costs. He particularly wondered whether those patients who report high levels of subjective financial burden coped in ways that were medically dangerous, such as not filling their prescriptions. Even at a simplistic level such as this, it should be obvious there are lots of possible analysis strategies. Since there's a primary question, which we ultimately framed as what's the relationship between the subjective financial burden and medication non-adherence, and various related questions, such as what different mechanisms do patients use to cope with the cost of cancer care. The natural place to start is the manuscripts Table 1. In the medical paper, Table 1 is usually a description of the study population. For example, age, gender, and various clinical characteristics. Creating the table is straightforward. I tend to follow a couple of principles. First, I won't group data as much in Table 1 as in the remainder of the paper. For example, if 26 patients had Medicare insurance and two patients had Medicaid, I'd probably leave them as separate entries, even if the remainder of the paper uses a single variable as Medicare and or Medicaid. Secondly, when discussing Table 1 in the text, I'll ask my colleagues what information helps provide context. Here, for example, it might be useful to know whether patients have recently started chemotherapy or have been under treatment for a long period of time. 
since those people who have already gone through expensive and unsuccessful treatment might be particularly disposed not to fill prescriptions because of their cost. The natural next step would be to decide whether to treat financial distress as a continuous or a categorical variable. It's actually based on a single item. And this slide gives the possible re response categories and the number of patients per category. If we were to decide to dichotomize burden into significant or catastrophic versus less of a burden, the data will have cooperated by yielding sufficient numbers in both categories. Were we to di dichotomize financial burden, this would induce a subtle change to the question. It would change from what's the relationship between burden and adherence to do patients at high versus low levels of financial burden also tend to be more or less adherent with their medications. The investigators decided that placing an increasing focus on patients at high versus low level of financial distress would be a good thing and that would help focus the analysis. Before making a final decision, I performed one last data check. I already verified that the sample sizes per group were consistent with dichotomizing financial burden. I also checked for a dose response. In other words, did I see a monotonic pattern where non-adherence -incre non increased with increasing distress? In fact, I did, which provided reassurance that the dichotomized analysis would provide a fair representation of the results. This presentation, with the sample sizes added, would probably be worth including in a manuscript, so it not only helps readers to visualize the results, but reassures them that the key analytical decision to simplify things by dichotomizing financial burden Still leads, to, still leads to a fair rendering of the study results. Having de decided to dichotomize financial burden, I'd probably return to Table 1 and add columns for patients with low and high financial burden. So you'd have the overall study population and then the population grouped into low and high burden. This would also put us in a position to compare sociodemographic and clinical characteristics of the two groups. I then start in a similar process of deciding how to code the outcome variables. Here I probably start with a presentation as illustrated in the slide, ideally with the various coping strategies categorized in some way. One natural classification would be medically dangerous or not. For example, using savings to pay for financial care might be financially painful, but it shouldn't lead to poorer clinical outcomes. However, spreading out appointments could. This slide will also provide the reader with context. SN, well, here are all the possible coping strategies. It looks as if patients at significant financial burden use most of the strategies more than patients who aren't. Now we're going to focus on just some of those strategies. In fact, we ended up focusing on the four strategies that pertain to medications and were potentially dangerous. Didn't fill a prescription, only filled part of a prescription, replaced a prescription drug with an over-the-counter drug, and purchased medications from another country. This is what the portion of the table that just pertained to those variables might look like. It turns out we're seeing consistent results in the patients that high levels of burden are using all the strategies more than other patients. Next, next question might be, well, should we perform four separate analysis, that is, one per uh, non-adherent strategy, or whether to somehow combine the information about these four variables into a single outcome? This is another decision that requires both looking at the data and carefully reconsidering the study question. This slide illustrates a very simple summary, simply counting the number of positive items per question without considering their, their joint pattern. It tells us that half the patients don't have any problem at all with medication adherence. And almost everyone that's not in here is, a, is just one or two items. From the PBRIS table, we also know the problem is mostly with filling prescriptions. After considering all this information, the investigators decided that, well, an adherence problem is an adherence problem and they're all bad, and that it would be fair to restate the study question, asks, are patients at higher versus low levels of financial distress more, like, more or less likely to have at least one type of problem with medication adherence? The information in this and the last slide would probably belong in a manuscript because it helps our readers visualize how we got to the adherence outcome then we haven't done violence to the data as a result. We're now in a position to create the main data summary, which in this case is quite simple. We're just simply counting adherence uh, for the low versus high financial distress groups. <laughs>
The final analytical step might be to perform some modeling. Again, this is a place where the task is to select the version of the statistical technique that best matches the study question. Here, there are two obvious choices. The investigators want to maintain the focus on financial burden. They might formulate the question as one pertaining to adjustment. For example, after accounting for all the other factors that we know might be associated with non-adherence, does financial burden still matter? Another version, after accounting for the systematic differences between patients at high versus low levels of financial distress, illustrated in Table 1, does financial burden still matter? On the other hand, if the investigator is more interested or, or also interested in the question of what in general predicts non-adherence, we'd be in a variable selection application. In either case, the visualization of the data would precede us in our class. From the data side of things, we'd be checking for patterns of missing values, predictors with little variation, highly correlated predictors, possible outliers, and so forth. And from the conceptual side of things, we'd be developing a formal analytical framework to, among others, justify our choice of variables. The ideal technical report provided by the analyst and investigator would be an iteratively developed document containing all of the above information plus some interpretation and commentary. For example, some text that justifies the various analytical choices that we made, which will be useful for the manuscript eventually, and also provides substantive interpretation in the study results. For a manuscript, you'd pick and choose from this technical report going from the simple to the complex, especially including those elements that help the reader to visualize what you did and what you saw as a result, and telling a coherent story.